same thing with semen. People are coming, going, it's a Ponzi scheme. And, um, and yeah, so, so this is my next, this is my next big investment. Uh, I'm all in on it. I believe that it can replace all of those other things. I hope, uh, and believe that at some point in the near future, those functionalities, the, the photo stream functionality of Instagram, the micro post stream of Twitter, will, uh, you know, the, the video, uh, network of YouTube will all be incorporated into Steam it. Welcome everybody to the Steam Smart Podcast, episode two. I'm here with Gabriel Shear, that's Pied, Pied Piper. And our guest today is Andrew Levine, that's Andrarchy. How are you doing today, Andrew? Doing well, how are you? Awesome. Awesome. Doing great. Really having a lot of fun with uh, Steam. Cool. So, so yeah, just before we, uh, we started, we were uh, talking about um, experimentation, right? And things changing over time. What, what question did you ask me again? Do you remember? Um, well, I, I, I think I just said, how are you doing? And you were like, Oh, uh, well, I'm doing well. I'm trying out different stuff and, and this, this podcast seems to be doing well. And, and I just responded saying that, yeah, I think experimentation is really key to this platform. And actually, I, I think that answers another question that you, that you might have brought up, uh, which is that um, the, the moods of people changing uh, crap, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> As we also discussed, I didn't get a lot of sleep, so uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to gather my thoughts. Um, but I do think, yeah, we were talking about the importance of experimentation yeah. on the platform. No, I, I think things, I think actually the community could easily in the future fragment in the sense that you could have... Um, you know, of course, there are going to be lots of interfaces for it, not just steamit.com, but you could have an interface that only shows uh, certain um, users, you know, let's say there's a, you know, like on, on Reddit, we have subreddits, you know, and a subreddit, yeah. in many cases, only, uh, only approved submitters can, can actually submit new posts, new top level posts. And so, for example, I, uh, I, I shared... Um, Steam with an, a group of libertarian authors that I'm involved with. And one of the guys said, oh, my God, the social justice warriors have invaded and they attacked my friend, you know. And so I, thought, I, I said to him, well, in the future, you know, maybe you'll, you'll make a, an interface for Steam that, you know, bans all the SJWs, you know, and you can have your safe space. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a pretty natural way for it to go. I think that that functionality will be served in one way or the other, whether it's in a similar format as, as other places or, or in, a, in a format that is specific to Steam it. I, you know, I think, um, I, I, I wonder if people are overestimating how similar products and services that are built on top of Steam or in conjunction with Steam it will resemble products and services that came before it. Um, I think it'll serve the same functionalities, but it probably won't work exactly the same. Just like when you go to Steam, it, it doesn't really look like anything. I don't know. It, uh, it seems a bit, I don't know. Steam it is probably the most similar looking product that'll be built on top of Steam to anything that came before it because it had, to, because it has to be familiar. But I, I think that um, I think that the future stuff will be more and more divergent from past stuff. Just like when you, the the, the more mature the internet gets, the the more different the products and services that are built on top of it look from the products and services that existed in the analog world. And actually, I think that's a big problem with a lot of people who are building stuff for the internet. Even still, even as mature as the internet is they're still creating facsimiles of analog products and services instead of products and services that are designed for the internet. Uh, but that's, that's, um, 
that's another thing. Yeah, yeah, I think, well, I mean, the feed also is already a move in that direction. Like, I really only check my feed. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't see anybody I don't want to see, which is actually, I, I always thought this was kind of an interesting point. I don't know if it's an admission that I should be so eager to make, but I don't actually consume that much content on SEMA. I don't, uh, you know, um, people might share stuff with me. I might be part of a group that shares links, but there's so much content, but I spend most of my time creating content. Yeah. You know, it, that's, that, that's what I see my role as there. Uh, the other thing, I, I, it finally came to me, the other thing I wanted to talk about with respect to experimentation, which is that that's actually part of the role I see for myself on the platform is mm -hmm. experimenting with my, my content so that people who follow me or find me uh, can get ideas for themselves and, um, and experiment themselves. And at first, it all kind of happened by accident. I would notice that I would put out something original, something weirdly different and original. And then somebody, and then an hour later, somebody who had commented on my stuff or liked it was putting out very similar content that, uh, you know, with, with, generally people will, will throw me a reference or something, but sometimes they, they wouldn't. And at first I was like, Hey man, that's not cool. Mm. And then I was like, well, I guess that's uh, the service you provide now, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it, you know, and it, it, as long as that, that person needs me to come up with ideas for them, then they need me. And, you know, so it, it, it you're probably, a trendsetter. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, they might have a, fan, a, a, a more specific name because I'm, I don't know if I'm popular enough to be a trendsetter, um, but uh, maybe an influencer or something. But I think, I think I throw a lot of ideas out there. I don't know, but, you know, like even it's to the point that you made earlier, um, it, even that model... I feel like is evolving. Like the type of content that I make is, is itself evolving and it's actually cohering on a limited set of stuff. Just like you're, you know, cohering on this podcast, I'm starting to find the kind of few things that I, I might start focusing on. Like, Weirdly, I'm going back to articles. <laughs> I posted an article the other day uh, that did well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because, because I have enough people watching the YouTube videos, um, enough people following me on Steemit that now I can start, I, I don't know, I'm rambling. That's a thing that happens. <laughs> Sometimes the best things come out in a ramble. So let me just backtrack for a second. Sure. Tell Tell our listeners about Andrew Levine. He's a former lawyer, former entrepreneur and investor. He, um, he came up with an idea once. He said in New York City that uh, the landlords are jerks and don't make any money off their rent uh, because they uh, are just trying to uh, get to where they can sell the property. And so he proposed that there be nice guy landlords that take care of their tenants and thus uh, keep them around and keep uh, vacancies down. Because in the situation he was working in, uh, you, you guys already owned the, the apartment buildings, right? And he yeah. was told, that's just not the way we do things. <laughs> and I, I, I pulled out a quote just to kind of, uh, I think perhaps maybe, maybe summarizes something that uh some important facet of andrew he said this is his quote people without degrees are dumb people must spend decades earning degrees then leverage those degrees to acquire a career in a large corporation then work in the field for a few decades once they've become vice presidents then maybe people will give them the respect they deserve and the corresponding ability to spearhead projects 
If people want to build something, they can't just build it. That would be anarchy. You know, and of course, Andrew wrote this uh, sarcastically. And I identify with this because there are a lot of people out there with a fixed mindset, you know, a mindset like things got to stay the way they are. Uh, don't try to improve them too much. Don't try to change too much. And I think that's something that we have to work against. That, that's that's, that's kind of the enemy, actually, in a lot of stuff. A lot of things, that, good things that need to get done. Yeah, absolutely. Where, where, did, I, where did I say that stuff? I mean, uh, it I, might have been in one of your in your introduction posts or one of your one of your earlier posts, one of your earliest. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Geez. I, it's all such a blur. I guess I've forgotten things that I've said. I mean, yeah, that's all that's all true. I was just like, oh man, you really digged in there. But I guess I, I just put it in there. Um, yeah. I um. Wait, what is there a question? What was this question? <laughs> <laughs> do I still feel that way? Do I? Uh, I do. No, feel I was that, just introducing yeah. you. You know, I just thought uh, you know, so our readers could have a, a sense. Yeah, I think that's an interesting. I think that that was an interesting uh, stuff to pull, uh, because I don't even, I don't even know if when I wrote that, I realized that that's one of the beautiful things about Steemit is that if you have an idea that's actually good enough, you can make it happen already through Steam It. Like people are still underestimating the power of Steam It as it exists now. Uh, to illustrate that, I could say that most people still feel that the highest and best use of Steam It for them is to spend like 10 minutes churning out post after post after post. Well, maybe 10 minutes is unfair, but they churn out, if, if they max out at four posts a day, writing stuff, no one's that smart. I'm not that smart. I can't write four great posts a day. Mm. So, it, it, you know, if you think that's the highest and best use of that platform, I mean, maybe for you it is, but I don't think it is. You know, the highest and best use is that if you come up with a good enough idea, you can actualize it through Steemit. Now, if you post the idea on Steemit and it gets $5,000 in rewards, uh, you're well on your way to being able to actualize whatever that idea is. If you post it and you get $20, your idea was not good enough period you know so and and i think that or, or maybe maybe you need to develop it further yes that's a much more fair and nice way of putting it absolutely <laughs> absolutely that is a much better way of putting it yeah no, no yeah you need to go back to the drawing board figure out was it was it how you packaged the idea was it how you organized the idea or was there a fundamental flaw within the idea that you need to fix to make it a good idea being overly simplistic, you know, kind of for dramatic effect. But uh, yes, you're, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, and yeah, I did, I, I, I did want to do that nice guy landlord thing. Um, but yeah, no. It didn't work. That's just not the way we do it. Yeah. Yeah. It, I it, hate those words. Yes. And um, you, you brought it up that, that some people are stuck in, in that mindset. And in my case, it was because they were older. I think, I think, um, you know, it's a natural part of getting old. They, they'd been in real estate for 35 years. And this is kind of interesting. I don't know if you guys know this, but you actually perceive time differently as you age. You, um, the older you get, the faster time moves. So by the, so yeah. by the time you're 33, the portion of your life after you're 33 goes as fast as the portion of your life before 33 because you perceive time differently. Mm -hmm. And so when you're old, you actually feel like 30 years ago was like not that long ago. So they're I, like, I read know, something about this recently. Yeah. 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 So, Actually, so I, I'm 45. So I, 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 I 
<laughs> I'm trying to slow down life. So Steam it opened yesterday. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, in New York, uh, most of the people in real estate are quite old. And for them, it wasn't that long ago that New York City was an anarchist dystopia. It was chaos and and violence and prostitution and and like dirt and disgustingness. And yeah. so they're used to this adversarial relationship with tenants because they had an adversarial relationship with tenants. Mm. And, and then that went away. Property values skyrocketed for for interesting reasons that even they don't understand, actually, because they don't understand macroeconomics. Um, most people in real estate, they're just like, real estate's a good investment. <sighs> like, it, it's, it's crazy how living in New York City, having access to, to you know, the kind of masters of the universe and seeing some of the richest people in the world and meeting them and being like, oh, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> interesting. Um, but we, but that's, I won't ramble on about that anymore. Hey, Gabriel, you want to jump in? You got a question? Oh, man, there's so much been going on here on Steam it this last week. It's like I've been producing a little bit less. I've been quieter than normal. Just mm. there's all this development going on, and it's really interesting to just kind of step back for a minute and observe, you know. There's yeah. all these new people jumping in. A lot of them think they're geniuses because they come from an e economics background or something. And they have no idea what they just got into. <laughs> and it's, well, like, ah, it's like, like an it's like kids yeah. found this, this new toy and they have no respect for it whatsoever. And they're trying oh, yeah. to figure out how to play with it properly. And oh my God, it's crazy. Like just the other day we had this big thing where someone got flagged and it pissed a bunch of people off and stuff. And so mm. all of a sudden there's all these debates on what is flagging? What's it for? And like, that's not even something that there is any consensus on, even amongst whales, right? Mm -hmm. So it sparks all these debates and stuff and people saying, oh, Steam, it's broken because it's not the way I think it should be, you know? And it's like, it's so cool to just step back and think about it in the bigger picture sense, from the sense of like this platform, this interface that we're all using right now is just the first of many, right? And it was designed a very specific way to serve very specific functions. And yeah, it's probably not going to be what everybody wants it to be specifically. But, you know, that's where the free market kicks in to meet those other wants and needs, right? Like the source code is open now. How awesome is that? Everyone who doesn't like the way that it is right now can run off and make a new one that is the way that they like it. It's freaking amazing. And like, there's so much power here. These, these payouts for like when people propose an idea and they get thousands of dollars thrown at it, like the power of that mechanism is underappreciated. I think Andrew was talking about that briefly. Like it's like we just wandered into this new mechanism that never existed before and we haven't really got to the point where we appreciate what it should and could be used for. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think the, uh, I think the people who are most passionate about the platform, like, like us, do feel that. And that's part of the reason why it's so uncomfortable to, to witness people who don't get it. But uh, the same token, whatever the expression is, <clears throat> this is something I struggle with a lot. So I, I, really under, uh, I really feel this and I totally agree. It's, but, but then I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, it's new. They don't understand. And that's great content, <laughs> you know, to, to, like, and that's a lot of what you do is boiling stuff down, putting it into these short videos and being like, do you get it? And there, there's so much opportunity there. And it, and it does speak to the power of the platform that, okay, if you don't see, if you see something going wrong, you can make money pointing it out. The flip side to that is if somebody who is less perceptive uh, comes on board, they'll see things that they don't like and they'll make content on it. And people who agree with them will upvote it even if 
they're not that bright. They didn't really get it. Like I just went on today and I saw a, a post like that and I read it and I was like, this isn't well written. This isn't well thought out. There's no logic. There's no proof. There's no premises. There's no conclusions. It's a chaotic mess. There's no references. There's no, I mean, like, it, it's amazing how many economic arguments, this wasn't even that. This wasn't even an economic argument. But it's amazing how many economic arguments people make and still show no proof. Um, and yeah, it, it, and, and I was like, yeah, but you know, <clears throat> I mean, it speaks to the immaturity of the platform that content like this is still doing well and, you know, Oh God, sorry. My thoughts are all over the place today. Well, I saw, um, I saw a post this morning. I checked it uh, this morning and it's from yesterday. And basically the post is by a person. I'm just going to mention him, uh, Barry Cooper, a person I respect. He's a former narcotics agent and um, he created like several guides about how to grow weed and get out of uh you know, prosecutions for possession of weed and whatnot. So, I mean, he, he, was, he was there, you know, he was one of the bad guys and he came out of it and he helped people avoid the bad guys. A lot of respect. And he suffered for it personally too. But his post this morning said uh, basically that it's inherently unfair because whales have too much power and they can sink posts or, or, or take earnings away from posts that otherwise deserve it, you know, and, and he went to such an extreme that he basically said, you cannot succeed unless, you know, you, you can't succeed because if, unless you're a whale. And it's, I, I looked at his post and I thought, okay, you just earned like $2,000 from that. All right. That right there, this proves your whole argument. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I respect the guy. I respect his concerns. You know, whales do have a lot of power. But still, I mean, you just made $2,000 from that. So, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I don't worry. My, um, my, my Bluetooth headphones died. <laughs> um, no, but I heard everything you said, and I, and I agree completely. In fact, that post seemed a little cynical mm -hmm. to me because it – which – now, as always, the great thing about Steemit and this ecosystem is that I think it is far stronger than anybody who tries to cynically exploit it. I think it's far more resilient than that. And I think that if it isn't, then it needs to be fixed. And so even people who are trying to exploit it are actually helping it. But that being said, if I'm going to put that aside, because it's not like I'm, and I was actually, I was thinking about that post this morning and I was actually thinking like, you know, um, is this a thing that really needs to be addressed? Is it, is, do I, e.g., do I need to make a post about this phenomenon? And the conclusion I came to pretty quickly was no, there's always going to be this, you know, we'll pro the, the most popular content creators on the platform will presumably not be the smartest people on the platform. That's rarely who's the most popular. Mm. A, a silver lining way to look at it could be if he's our, if people like him, people like Jeff Berwick are our you know, popular personalities, that's not so bad. That's an improvement maybe over Miley Cyrus or who, you know, or whoever is the, the most popular people in other like cultures and societies or whatever. You know, if ours are maybe a little too much conspiracy theory, a little too rough around the edges. Scammy. You know, a little too scammy, yes, yeah, yeah. You know, and I see that, and I'm like, man, you're you're hurt, you're hurting the platform. <laughs> but you know, I I do think that in some way they're probably helping it, and that it that it would be far more harmful to to somehow 
try to stop that from happening. I, I think the system will naturally eject those people and arguably they're a vital component of healthy growth of the ecosystem. Too many people, I think, are hoping that Steemit goes from this to Facebook tomorrow. Mm. And that would probably break the system. I, I'm, not, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not even a, 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 a blockchain expert. But I know that it isn't designed to be able to scale from whatever, 50, 100,000 to 4 billion or, or whatever, or 4 million. Or if you put enough hardware behind it, I'm sure it could. They claim that it is designed to scale easily that far and also scale beyond to facilitate things like uh, Visa, MasterCard transactions, like everything. So <laughs> yeah. this is just the tip of the iceberg here. No, I 100% I agree that, that it, it can scale uh, to, to, to those sizes. But um, I doubt it, but what I suspect would happen it's is the same thing look you know did, html is designed fault. to scale we you know? discover faults that's what yeah. you're saying yeah, yeah exactly problems. yeah if four million people join tomorrow a lot of flaws would be exposed and arguably the harm that such rapid adoption would inflict on the platform could be, you know for example if it crashed the site even if the the flaw wasn't within the blockchain but in the site itself and the site was crashed for a week or something, you know, that could set it back. Now, yeah. would we fix it? Yeah, I think that's another thing I think people don't understand. They go, well, what if the value goes to zero? Then people like me, people like Gabe, people like Dan would immediately start building another one. We would immediately start doing that. <laughs> you don't like, you don't get it. You don't, they're like, oh, you guys are, you know, it, I don't, I don't know what people say, but I assume that there are people going, this is very cult-like. It's like, yeah, yes, we're part of a cult and we really like this technology. And so we're going to keep being a part of this cult and keep building this technology. It's what built the internet is people who are part of this weird cult that nobody understood, but these guys believed in it and because for logical, rational, economics based reasons you know mm. it's the same fucking people that's a, a one of the posts that i wanted that i was thinking about doing is drawing is looking at the connection between libertarianism anarchism and entrepreneurship and technology it seems to be too tightly bound a connection to be coincidental uh, well, if, in fact, if you look at pretty much any of the awesome people in history, you see these people. Like, do you think Thomas Edison was like an alpha, you know, uh, football player? Like, I'm sure he was just like us, you know? He loved creating stuff. He loved, well, I mean, a lot of people aren't fans of Edison, but, you know, or Tesla or Einstein, you know, all these people like, People wind up saying, oh, they were, they were in favor of these political policies. But if you read them, they're pretty, they're pretty libertarian, you know, mm -hmm. just like all the great philosophers, John Stuart Mill, you know, John Locke, like all of the great enlightenment philosophers, they're not fucking socialists, you know, at best they're libertarian socialists, but, um, you know, they're libertarian. But I, think, I think Einstein was a little bit of a socialist. I think he was. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard that. Um, and it, it, it may very well be true, but, you know, there is, there are a lot of socialists who aren't, I mean, I, I would say, I, I'd be curious to see if he was really a socialist or a libertarian socialist. Because I doubt he would have been like, if you had a conversation with him, and I really think he was too smart for you to go, hey, so government is this group of people who are immune to corruption, right? I think he'd be like, no, they're the most corrupt people on the planet. You know, uh, I think he, you know, he would probably just say like, look, we're really smart. We can solve really hard problems if we work together. That's, um, you know, that, so, so I, you know, I'd be curious to see, I mean, he, 
I mean, I'd be curious to see the proof. Like, maybe, maybe he was, but I, I really doubt he was. He can't have been dumb enough to be like, yeah, this group of people in Washington, D.C. can solve all of our problems, can feed the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be shocked if uh, he said anything like that. I think a lot of really brilliant people get confused for socialists, like, um, like Carl Sagan. Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, people believe he's a socialist. It's not true. He is, uh, what he claims to be is an anarcho-syndicalist or a libertarian socialist, which is fundamentally different. I'm not saying he's right. I'm not saying he's right about his philosophical beliefs, but he wrote a book. I mean, there's a book uh, of his called On Anarchism. He is an anarchist, you know, yeah. but there are a lot of anarchists who have socialisty ideas. And that's fine. I don't actually agree with those with those anarchists. But at the end of the day, they accept, you know, things like the non-aggression principle. And they just think that they, they usually they're often very conspiratorial. And so they tend to think, well, no, there's this elite group who's suppressing every, which is close to true. You know, they're usually very close to the truth. And then these we and then these slight divergences because individuals are flawed and we all have imperfect information leads them to go down this road that is very similar to socialism and which is scary. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it necessarily makes them a true socialist in the sense that, you know, like a Soviet socialist, mm -hmm. which is really the thing we sh people should be scared of, like Soviet style socialism, mm -hmm. which is not dead, unfortunately, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and is not dead in America. But Take a look at, at George Diamandis, for example. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. He's a very noted futurist involved in singularity stuff, respected influencer on, uh, you know, all this tech stuff. He recently posted something saying, we should experiment with government, uh, with, um, you know, like in the same way that we've experimented with uh, Uber and, uh, and electric cars and all this other stuff, we should open up government to experimentation as well, which I agree 100%. This is a very smart guy. You know, you would think, you know, he would be thinking deeply on this topic. But I think some people are smarter in some areas than others, you know, because it requires a lot of thought sometimes to, to be smart in a particular thing. And he said his, his approach was not something like market anarchism. His approach was talking about digital voting, essentially. You know, like he's, he's it's like slapping a veneer of uh, blockchain tech stuff on top of the existing foundations, very weak foundations. You know, instead of just going back to the basics, sweeping the whole thing away and saying, well, how do we, how do we, you know, how do we start over from the beginning from a first principle, such as respect for individual liberty, you know, and I know you're big on first principles, Andrew. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it is always interesting to, to see that stuff uh, and see how people have um, limited vision. <laughs> hey, let's change everything. Digital voting, yeah. Oh, well, hey, man, you're real innovative. Um, but but at the same time, you know, hey, he's. I guess he's doing the best he can. He's challenging his his beliefs and stuff. Um, yeah, it it it's it, it's part of the natural order. The the ideas, and this is another idea for for a post I've been thinking about, and it, it, it's kind of part of my my personal philosophy, which is that. Um, Innovative ideas start on the fringes of a population and then they radiate in towards the center and the center being the mainstream. So it, maybe this guy thinks he is a real crazy thinker, but like if this is the population and this is the, this is the, the mainstream in here, he's like here, you know, that, like that's what you're saying is he's coming here. He's not coming to us. Now the unfortunate reality of the human condition is like we know we're right right we know we're, we're we know we know we're more right than all these other people are but it's kind of a tragedy of human nature that if 
if humanity worked by picking people like us and go, you're right, we're just going to jump on board now. We're all going to jump on board right now. You know, what would be to stop them from doing that with Bernie Sanders? Or, you know, you know the, the population has to process information at its speed and people like him are part of that process and arguably he's part of that bridge that moves the, the, the majority of the population towards what the libertarians have always been saying, which is kind of how it always works. John Stuart Mill was a fucking weirdo. Nobody else was saying that stuff when he wrote his book. That's why it was interesting. That's why it was amazing. That's why it was revolutionary. Um, but, you know, it takes time for people to come on board and they have to kind of be shepherded by intermediaries who they trust and who, and who aren't as extreme sounding as us. You know, it, it, there's, a, there's an evolutionary reason why the majority of the population doesn't vacillate dramatically between ideological beliefs there's a, you know the in other words there's a reason why the majority of the population is conservative is conservative in and by conservative i only mean reluctant to change you know the majority of the population has to be reluctant to change and a minority always has to be pushing the boundaries one side pushes it one way, one side pushes it the other way. And depending on the environment, the mass moves, the massive center moves towards one or the other. Um, but yeah, so unfortunately, I think that stuff is kind of an inevitable necessity of the human population. And we will die and there will still be guys like that who think they're blowing minds and will be out there on the fringes going, Jesus, dude, you have no idea what kind of world you could live in. I mean, we could we could be in space right now. Why aren't we in space right now? Yeah, I think though. Uh, Elon Musk is also a libertarian. Is he? Is he? I yeah. don't know that. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, people, most libertarians hate him, so nobody thinks he's a libertarian. But he he is. I'm pretty sure he's admitted it. Peter Thiel is a libertarian. Mm. They're best friends. Um, yeah, he's a libertarian. He just thinks that he's just a libertarian who's willing to, to chew the glass of dealing with mainstream society. He wants to go to space. What do you got to do? You got to mm. fucking go into Senate congressional committees and you have to put on a suit and you have to convince them to give them to give you the money that they took from everybody so that they don't give it to ExxonMobil. You know, and honestly, he's, he, I think he's just, it, it's a very thankless endeavor. It's made him very rich, but um, I still think it's pretty thankless. But anyway, sorry. I think though, I don't think we're limited. You know, you said that there is this big mass of people and they resist change and <clears throat> it's probably always going to be that way. But I disagree because I think that technology we're moving towards a future where individuals are hyper empowered. And one of the authors that has spoken about this uh, that I like is uh, John Robb, a former Air Force guy, uh, Special Forces kind of guy. And uh, he's talked about it more in a context of terrorism, you know, and uh, groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS and whatnot are examples of that, you know and how they can inspire one person to commit an act in the United States, for example, a terrorist act that can have, uh, that can cost, for example, the Boston uh, bomb, marathon bombing. They locked down, you know, how much did it cost to, to, to make that attack happen, you know? Now, compare that with what it cost the United States. For example, they shut down the city of Boston for one day which may have cost them a billion dollars in, in economic output, you know? So if you look at it as a return on investment, it's incredibly profitable what they did. Now, I'm not talking about hyper-empowered in that sense. I'm talking about hyper-empowered to push change forward, not necessarily onto the masses, 
But for those of us who want it, you know, we can go off and do our thing and then, you know, we can, uh, you know, thumb our noses <clears throat> out at them and be like, you're really missing out, guys, you know. And we, we have that power. It's growing every day. And uh, so I think the balance of power that you were talking about there is changing and is probably going to flip uh, in the near future. Yeah, well, the, the way that I would put it is that, you know, this is kind of a theory I've been working on, but, you know, libertarians are kind of the brain of the population and uh, everybody else is, can be thought of as the body as the appendages, they eventually go along with what the brain wants, whether they understand why or not. So yes, I totally agree that decentralized uh, technologies, distributed technologies will fundamentally change the way that we, that we solve problems like crime, like terrorism in the future, and that everybody will participate in them. But uh, I doubt there will ever be a time where everybody considers themselves a libertarian, which is fine. For example, Uber. Uber is a great example of this. People don't, pe people use Uber. They understand intuitively that it's awesome. They're fully on board to the extent that they will defend libertarian principles with respect to Uber, not because they could believe themselves to be libertarian, but because they understand intuitively how much better this is than what came before it uh, mm. and how much they don't want to go back to something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that um, that will be how this happens. You know, pe the majority of people, they go, this is great. I want everything to stay like this. And then you ha and then, and then people on the fringes fight and fight and fight to change things to make them better. And then once that thing finally gains mass adoption, the flip switches and they go, oh, this is now, this is what we have now. It's better than what we used to have. Therefore, now I like this. Now I'm going to stick with this forever. And it, it's part of creating we evolved that way because it's very important to create stable societies. Uh, stability is the most powerful force in the universe. It's, it's, it's actually, and it's arguably the only force in the universe. This is kind of going into my personal philosophy and what I believe the science shows us. Uh, the move towards stability predates the move the creation of light. So light was created. So as far as we know, the universe started as just uniform energy, the, the um, fundamental energy that makes up the universe in a was uniformly spread in an infinitely like dense, you know, mass or whatever. And that was infinitely unstable. And as that, those energies moved from that infinitely unstable state to more stable states, we get to the creation of all of the stuff that came after, including light. So arguably stability is the most important force in the universe. And the same is true, and that, and that is also what has driven the evolution of life on Earth, the evolu and then the evolution of mankind is the move to form stable organisms and the move to form stable societies. And with human beings, the ability to form stable societies has enabled us to go from a population of thousands, hundreds of thousands, I forget what the original population of like 70,000 years ago it was, it was tiny. Hmm. And now we're a population of billions like our information is, is that is that much more stable now because a thousand of us, millions of us die all the time. And the system keeps on going. The population keeps on growing. Humanity keeps on persisting. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for people like us who see the potential for change, and I'm sure, by the way, that socialists feel the exact same way, right? They're like, look, if you would just get on board with bureaucrats 
controlling everything and you just believe that that would solve everything, we'd all be in a utopia now, you know? Um, mm -hmm. They're wrong, we're right. But, um, you know, if we were jumping around like that, we wouldn't have a very stable society, unfortunately. We have to prove that we're right. We have to earn it. We have to show them with incontrovertible proof that, you know, that's the thing. They go, you guys are greedy. You guys are greedy. And then once we make them rich, then they come on board. That's, that's, how, that's how it works, right? Like libertarians push technology forward. Technology makes, raises standards of living. And one standard of living is, is improved. People don't revolt. People don't, um, you know, disrupt the status quo because they're so happy to be in a stable, wealthy, you know, technologically advanced society. And that's part of the human thing. I don't think there's ever been a society that wasn't more technologically advanced than the one that it displaced. Like that's an incredibly crazy reality, you know, that very few people understand, I think. Mm -hmm. You didn't build that, Andrew. What's that? You, you didn't build that. I know, I know, I know. I didn't. It's 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 very true. It's it's true. Yeah, yeah. And I, I know. I'm just. It's it's so funny. Like, money is such a non thing for me, but I, I've I've come out on the side of, and I don't even consider myself an anarcho capitalist. But um, the art. But I often and more similar to anarcho-capitalists, I guess, than, than anybody else. Yeah, I mean, this whole, this phrase, change the world, has kind of become like almost a sore spot for me because it comes with this implication that you're changing other people's world. You know, it's like... Interesting. I, I, I stopped saying that a, a long time ago, even though, like, I would prefer to see things differently than they are now, but... I. I stopped saying that and I started saying, change my world. And it's, it's not much of a difference really semantically and stuff, but the implication is that it's a focus on the part of the world that I have a right to control, that I have a right to influence, like my own local property, for instance, my family, the things that I can actually have a real influence over, the things that I can actually see a tangible change when I apply myself to it. And it also implies that I'm not stepping on other people's rights to mold their worlds the way that they want them. So you're absolutely right. There's a ton of socialists out there that think that they have a great idea of how things should run. And there's a whole bunch of them that can group together and get along just fine. It's funny, like I grew up watching Star Trek and after a while, I started noticing how certain episodes were very clearly written by socialists and other episodes were very clearly written by anarchists and libertarians. Right? It's, like, it's like the room full of writers must have been arguing like crazy as to how to proceed because they couldn't uh, agree. There's a lot of good ideas out there. And it's a matter of experimentation and respecting other people's right to experiments just as we have that right too. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And, and these, uh, to go back to when you were talking about people who, who, who argue that, that steam it is unfair. It's like, yeah, all right. T yeah, if you're a socialist, uh, you know, your world sounds actually really fucking boring, but it also sounds kind of nice. So why don't you go over there into your little corner we can call it the kids' corner. <laughs> Sorry. That's mean. That's that's so mean. That's so mean. But you go over there, and you you can use this technology that that we made. Now I'm taking credit. Um, yeah, no, I didn't build it. Um, and 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 do it. This is perfect for that. Oh oh, it's unfair that the whales have an unfair advantage. Okay, get rid of that bit. It's just code. It's just code for enabling social transactions the tr transmission of information, the transmission of resources, go do it. And they're like, and, and, oh God, sorry. I just am filled with so many negative thoughts mm -hmm. sometimes. And I'm just like, no, you're too fucking stupid to do that, aren't you? Yes. 
Why don't you just listen to the big boys? Um, God, that's so that's so patronizing. Sorry, we're all um, thinking. <laughs> yeah, you know, but but I think that was a really good point. I don't want to distract from that that difference of of changing uh, of switching from changing the world to changing your world. I think that it is a small change, but it's a big it's a, it's a big difference too. And I w totally went through the same thing. And. And it, uh, another thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately, I don't know if, if, if you guys feel like this is pertinent to, to your lives, but I've believed many of these things in the past. So I have to be a little bit more considerate um, of people's, it, it's tempting sometimes to go, oh, I see, I switch my beliefs real quick. I think maybe that's something that's particular to our type of demographic is that we go, I have a belief, and I'm willing to pursue this to the ends of earth. And then we dive in for 24 hours, and we go, oh, shit, nah, bad idea. <laughs> Doesn't work. Whereas most people go, this is a good idea. This is what I believe till I die now, because it makes me feel good, mm -hmm. right? I believe that everybody's the same, and that, which, which by the way, I believe. Uh, but they go, I believe everyone's the same. Therefore, I believe everybody should be treated exactly the same. Therefore, everybody deserves exactly as many resources as everybody else. And somehow that magically leaps to, I'm going to take a tiny group of powerful people and make that their role, is distributing resources based on their judgment of what's fair and what's not. You know, um, but... Uh, yeah, so, so sometimes I find myself going, you're so stupid to, to people who are believing something that I believed one year ago. And then I'll be like, yeah, maybe you, maybe you need to be a little bit more consistent. Like in economics, that's, that's very, I find that to be very common, is that you, you learn about gold, you learn about fiat currency, and if you stop, you can believe some, some bad, some, not bad, but some in my opinion, incorrect things. Whereas if you keep going, you, you, you learn more and you get a deeper understanding of it. And, and then I'll be looking back and be like, oh, you guys are so stupid. I believe that like two months ago. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, ch changing your world. And, and there's something very, the way I see it, and it's the same thing with changing the world. Now, when I go on dating profiles, because I online date, because I'm single in New York City, and I see, when I see people say, I want to change the world, I have a very visceral reaction to it, even though it wasn't very long ago that I was using the same phraseology. And I honestly believe, I want to change the world. And now I look at it, and it's also really, it's kind of, narciss it's kind of narcissistic, egocentric, this belief that you, sh that you should be able to. Like most of the people... Most of the people I'm seeing online who are going, I want to change the world are like fashion designers. They're like, you know, they're not anything that should be changing the world. And I'm like, oh my God, do you honestly think that you should even be able to change the world? Like, I'm glad society is designed to not enable any idiot with a keyboard to change the world. And I, and I think it's a much more healthy perspective and less egocentric perspective to say, I'm just going to change, change my world. It's not my job to change the whole world. That's actually where stuff gets dangerous. I mean, the people, you know, people think that what made Hitler or Mussolini or whatever bad was some arbitrary things that they pick on. These people thought that they deserved to be able to change the world and got enough people to agree with them that they did change the world. <laughs> and it was horrible and it was horrifying. You know, that's what happens when individual humans or even groups of human humans gain the power to change the world is they ruin it because, you know, you touched on this before about, you know, some people be, don't know as much as they should. That guy who was talking about digital voting, we're all pretty stupid. You know, um, th that's that's one of my first principles. The amount of information that we all possess, possess inside our minds is very, very limited. 
uh, and we're, we're not all right about everything. You know, even if you're great, if you're great, I would say you got 90% right, you know, and when you have the power to, to change the world, it's that 10% that winds up being actually the thing that changes the world and it's wrong and it's catastrophic and it's disastrous. That's, that's why the crowd is so important. That's why the wisdom of the crowd and figuring out how to leverage the wisdom of the crowd uh, well is, is so important and so powerful and why part of the recipe of why steam it is going to be so transformative is because it does not use the information in one person's brain. It uses the information that's embodied within the crowd to solve problems and to distribute resources. And that is an incredibly powerful mechanism as, as you kind of, as you touched on with respect to the rewards. Um, but thank God that they don't actually give the power to change the world to the crowd. Like, can you imagine if they did that? They, they appeal to the crowd for ideas and input, but the final decisions are made by the people who actually have the ability and the wherewithal and the mental capacity to do it well. Like, I know I don't know Jack compared to most of these programmers. Oh, no. like, and I'm very much at peace with that. And I trust them to do a much better job of managing and developing this technology than I ever could. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's fun to like spitball ideas, but this whole mentality of steam, it's broken. It should be fixed this way is just, I can't relate with that. <laughs> well, the, well, the crowd empowers the individuals at steam it to actualize their vision. Without the crowds, very explicit, very, you know, so, so there are individuals within the crowd. Every individual within the crowd has divergent views from every other individual in the crowd. But the crowd as a whole recognizes that having those guys fill that function is ideal. And that's why the community continues to grow, continue to develop. Why still, even the, the most vocal detractors acknowledge that it is better to stay within the platform, to stay under the oppressive, you know, thumb of the whales. You know, I, this is kind of funny and it's, it's, it's kind of divergent, but um, shit, I'm getting a lot of text messages. Um, uh, shit balls. Um, uh, one sec, one sec. We're, what were we talking about? God, my, I hate when people send you 30 text messages. Like, could you just put that in one text message? Um, the divergent views of, of the individuals within it. Yeah, I mean, um, like this idea. The most outspoken people still, yeah, okay. <laughs> the whales, here's my theory about the whales. And I think one of my talents is being able to think like a whale. And really, anybody who does well on it has to think like a whale. Yes. In my opinion, I mean, part of the fun, first of all, this is fun. It's fun that I don't know who the whales are, that they're this mysterious group of powerful individuals. They're not even that mysterious, but I don't like look into them because I kind of like the mystery of it. Um, they are borderline autistic computer nerds. That is who you want in control of your system. So, when people are like, oh, these guys have power, I'm like, okay, somebody's always going to have power. Uh, we agree that we need technological systems to help society function, to, to create the lubrication, to create the, the, you know, the mechanisms for information exchange and resource exchange. That's what human society needs. That's why we've had monetary systems throughout the ages. That's why we have political governmental systems is because we understand that that we need certain things and we make them with imperfect knowledge and flawed knowledge but you know there was a reason for government you know i'm not saying it was the perfect solution we're getting better and better ideas for what the ideal solutions would be but they did the best that they could at that time now if you're going to create a system like who do you want to be in charge of it? You want it, you don't want it to be emotional people. 
You don't want it to be people who are going, is this fair? Is this fair? You want people going, well, this is what currencies do. And this is what, you know, a commodity is. And if we can create, create a commodity out of thin air and call it steam and then use that to back a different currency and then, and then create something called, you know, this is the nerdiest system ever. Y yeah. That, that sounds about right. Having borderline autistic, maybe autistic people in charge of your machine. That's what you do is you put engineers in charge of your machine and they have to have influence with respect to that machine. They have no influence on the content. You know, I just want to clarify mm -hmm. the Steve Smart podcast does not think that what the whales are autistic. Okay. I mean, it is a compliment. <laughs> sorry guys. I know. Sorry. I, I, I'm borderline autistic. I mean, I, I score very high on the autism spectrum. I, I, I believe I'm pretty sure I would assume that most libertarians are on that side of the spectrum of that popular. They're very analytical. They're very data focused. Well, here's very, the you know, thing. Here's the thing. Are you familiar with the Myers Briggs type indicator system? Yes. Okay. Have you typed yourself? Yes. Okay. I'm guessing ENTJ or INTJ. Okay. INTJ. Okay. I mean, I'm INTJ. Good guess. Good guess. Well. Yeah, I'm right. a, I, I pretend to be an ENTJ. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Wait, wait, wait. What, what's E again? Emotion? Extroverted. Extroverted. Yes, I, I yeah. do pretend to do the E. Yeah, Gabriel is uh, INTP. And uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Gary Chartier, a professor, a stateless law expert, polycentric law expert, he recently did a poll on his Facebook page. He's well connected, asking libertarians and anarchists and whatnot their, um, their type. Huge numbers are NTs, yeah? NTs are very analytical. NTs are not that good with emotions, with feelings, as generally speaking, yeah? So there are also some NFs, NF types, which are more diplomatic feeler types, but still, it's the N. It's really the N, the intuitive part, yeah? Mm. That's, that's what you, when you're talking about the brain, you know, we're the brain of society, that's NTs. That's NTs. And a lot of NTs are libertarians. And I think most libertarians are NTs. And that has a lot to that. That's, that's the main thing I think feeding into this. this well, thing. yeah. Yeah. Well, also libertarians have on average higher IQs. Um, but what's your source for that? Uh, some, some article you can, you can Google it. You can Google yeah, it. Some article, right? <laughs> well, well, well it, honestly, actually it was, it was a liberal publication. Oh, see, this is, yeah, see, this is the, people, the thing a lot of people don't understand is that you can g gather very good evidence uh, from just from, from ordinary sources. Actually, I, I think this is something Chomsky kind of turned me on to. I'm not, a, I'm not actually a huge fan of Chomsky, but I find value in some of the things that he said in the past. And one of, one of those things was like, you don't have to not watch mainstream media. You just have to watch it and know what you're watching. And as long as you know what you're looking at, you can get tons of great data from it. And so I found this study. I, so, so what I looked up was intelligence of conservatives versus intelligence of liberals. And the argument that was being made by this liberal publication, by the way, I've been a liberal my entire life. I don't know what I am now, but I was never part of the conservative side of the population. Um, so it was, I'm pretty sure it was a liberal publication and they were like, yeah, yeah, technically conservatives and liberals have about the same IQ, but most conservatives are stupid. They're just raised up by the libertarians. And I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. Okay. It's the liberal. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. All the smart libertarians are raising up the conservatives. So libertarians are smart. So that was the source. It was actually a relatively re reliable source from what I remember because it wasn't coming from, I mean, that's one of the tricks is if you want to find good data, don't look at a source. Don't look at the sources that support your viewpoint. Look at the sources that oppose it and then look at their arguments, look at their evidence. And if they're right, it'll hold up, but they're usually not. And you could gain so much insight there by like, like with steam it, the big, the big um, issue with skeptics, this is good, I'm going to do a post on this, mm -hmm. is 
apparently, I'm only hearing this by secondary sources because I don't use Facebook, I don't use Twitter anymore. I don't use any, I create content for Steemit and I read Steemit and then that's basic and then I fucking don't sleep. Um, <laughs> um, is this issue of inflation. And uh, my, uh, my buddy, Sterling Luxon, uh, you guys know, you know Sterling? Sure. Sure. He's great. He's such a he's such a kind person. Um, he is like, hey man, I keep I keep getting into these arguments with people. It's about inflation. It's about the inflation of the steam money supply, and uh, I I totally understand where he's coming from. And so we talk about this a lot. And when he talks about the arguments for steam being inflationary, they're not even. Uh, this is an expression some people might be familiar with, but the problem with the arguments behind the inflationary arguments are that they're not even wrong. Right? It's not that they're wrong. It's not that they're argue that they're looking at the reality and they're state and they're pointing out flaws. It's that they're over here talking about shit that doesn't even make sense. So they're not even wrong. You know, um, and fuck, how did I, how did I, where, who? The where did Sterling was uh, talking to you about the inflationary argument that skeptics are making, and you had a response to that, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the main point I was trying to get at is that the, that the people making the inflationary arguments don't even understand how steam works. They don't mm -hmm. even understand how steam it works. They don't understand, they don't. Uh, probably the shortest response to them would be, do you understand the difference between the steam dollar and steam? Mm. Do you, do you understand, do, do you even know that there's a difference between steam and the steam dollar? Because the way I see it, none of them know. And so, so oh yeah. So the point was that you can actually learn a lot from listening to their arguments and what you would learn is that they don't even understand how it works. So like when I'm talking to them, I'm like, look, dude, it's not about the technical details with these people. It's that's not going to win them over because what you don't understand is that they don't understand the system. It's not that they have points. It's that they're literally ignorant. They're yeah. literally, they're by definition ignorant. I'm, I don't mean that in an offensive way. I mean, they don't know the difference between steam and steam dollars, which I, understand i actually empathize with because it's confusing and it's new it's a very it's revolutionary it is very revolutionary and to i'll, I'll try not to ramble on too much about this but and and I'll, I'll have more posts about this going forward dan dan realized that what bitcoin did was create gold out of thin air it, he realized that you could create a commodity out of thin air he then went okay well what are commodities really good for well they're great for backing currencies okay well maybe we should invent a currency good idea well if we're going to invent a currency and we're going to invent a commodity how do you best design the commodity to serve the function of backing a currency and that's what they did and if you don't if somebody doesn't understand that they have to understand that before they'll be able to understand why it's not inflationary if they don't intuitively already understand the beauty of steam. A lot of people intuitively understand, like um, I, th I would say like Stella Bell, uh, you guys know her, right? Sure. She's like famous, right? Sure. Um, she, may, she may understand it consciously, but I think she would agree that she recognized the beauty of steam it and, and the steam monetary system without fundamentally understanding the technical details. And so many, many people can do that. I think many, many more people will continue as it gains a foothold. But those, but those people who believe that if you create money out of thin air, you will create inflation, they will have to understand the technical detail. They will have to understand that fundamental difference. Yeah, that, um, that, that argument that just because it's created a new or new, that it's inflationary doesn't necessarily doesn't really make sense i mean the inflation can only it has to do with the supply of the money you know and it, relative to some starting point so yeah they're well yeah off well i'm working on kind of kind of um what are there's a i'm a fan of a guy called scott adams 
And what he talks about with respect to Donald Trump's oratory is he talks about those one-liners that he puts out as being like, I forget what he calls them, but like they're like death blows. Like that, uh, that's what I'm working on for, for these arguments is one sentence uh, answers yeah. mm-hmm. that, that will just be like, <clears throat> and actually the, the philosopher Robert Nozick uh, had a famous quote about this where he was like, the ideal argument is, I'm butchering it, but he was like, somebody says their argument, then you say their argument, then you say your argument, and then their brain explodes. <laughs> Like, so that's what I'm trying to do. But, and one of those things I think will be 90% of the new steam that is created is given to people who do not want to use it. Mm. Okay. It doesn't go into the money power. supply. So yeah. holders of well, steam power. Not immediately, at least. Because people can well, power it down. Well, yeah, I mean, you can, you can, you can go in, you could go into the technicals. Like when you're arguing with somebody, uh, the te- you know, technical details. Know, yeah, that it hasn't even read the yeah. white paper, yeah. But the truth is that you will acquire more steam the more you demonstrate to the community that you don't even want to cash out in the long term. Mm. That, you know, I, I, for example, if you, were post, if you posted this, this video and said, by the way, uh, a year from now, I'm just going to start powering down. How well would you do, right? So the people who would do best on the platform are the people who demonstrate that they never want, look, the ideal use of steam power, which I think will probably evolve over the long run, is a retirement fund. Mm-hmm. That's what it should be. It should be a way to build up capital that you can then cash out on. And so you want the minority of the population who is elderly to be cashing out and using that money to fund their lifestyles. But, um, but, but no, I mean, I think, or or mm -hmm. if you have some kind of ongoing mission, you know, that Steemit is just a vehicle for, you know, that's bigger than Steemit, that's bigger than earning money, then that steam power you can pass along to uh, the organization that you found to carry on that mission, you know, and so that that can that can actually, you know, as Gabriel was saying, it's a new funding source, you know, it's like a Kickstarter, but <laughs> like multiply, you know, to the tenth power, you know, and so you know, it's it's a resource that can go on and on and on, you know. Well, I'd, yeah, I, I'd put it I'd put it a different way. I mean, that's all true. That's all true. Um, but the other way that I would put it is that they give that 90% of the steam is allocated to people who care more about another trait of steam power than its ability to be converted into steam. The people who earn the most steam power are the people who want influence within steam more than they want steam. Mm. So it's irrational to think it's actually like definitionally like tautologically logically um irrational to think that 90 percent of the steam that is allocated to steam power is going to infiltrate the money supply because it is distributed specifically to people who don't want to introduce it into the money supply not because they're philanthropic philanthropic but because they want power because they want influence which is what i want i want to be able to mold i want to be sorry my cat is (laughs) did you see this this guy yeah yeah silly goat um and these people have concretely concretely evidenced that commitment by holding steam power you know it's not like they said well yeah sure i sure would like to you know maybe no they concretely evidenced it you know and everybody can see it well, well, yeah, well, absolutely. And the algorithm is, is technically designed to reward that. And if you really want to disprove this theory, you should, you should show me the line of code that distributes steam power to people who want to cash out, to people who want steam. And the, the, the way I was thinking about phrasing that for like maximum effect would be show me a person, show me a person who has steam power but who likes cashing it out? 
right? It's illogical. It doesn't make any, it's like, it makes your kind of head explode. Like find me one person who you have any reason to believe wants to inject that steam into the money supply. And that's actually why Dan, Dan refers to it as an accounting artifact. It, that is exactly what it is. It is an accounting artifact. The, the additional steam is produced and then it is thrown out. It is given to people who aren't going to use it. And that is because they want something else. They, they do want something. They're not, they're not, they're, they are self-interested, but what they want is influence within the ecosystem and we want them to have it. We yeah. want them to have it. So, uh, so, so really, it's and, very and, elegant that way. The design of the system is very elegant. Oh, it's beautiful. It is a beautifully designed system. And, and that's the thing. If you're a nerd, if you are an INTJ, ENTJ, autism, Asperger's, whatever, I suspect it's all the same shit, right? It's just a type of brain. You see it and you go, that's a Mona Lisa right there. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's gorgeous. But, and, and so then I think the way to go with the argument is to be like, all right, so I just reduced the amount of money printing that you believed happened by, by what, 900%, 1,000%? How have your ideas changed? You thought the money supply was increasing by 100% a year. That's not true. At the very least, it's dramatically less. Even if, every, even if half the population is cashing out, there's, is powering down, it's not true that, that the other half is also powering down. So you don't have an increase of the money supply by 100% a year. Well, the what money is supply does yeah. increase, but the money in circulation sure. is, is, you know, there's a different, it's, it, you know. Sure. Yeah, I guess that's true. It doesn't circulate or it doesn't, it's, there's, a, there's a serious break on the, the circulation. And sure. It, an incentive and a strong incentive against uh, circulation as well. Sure. Well, well, in 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 modern economy, in like the United States system, this is different. These these money supplies are differentiated in terms of like M one, M two, M three, right. stuff like that. Yeah, and so, that and so like M got and and I'm not an expert on them, but I think M one is basically the money supply that we all use. That's like everybody's using. And that, that's the money supply that leads to inflation. That's, that, that's where you that's look. That's what's in circulation and use. Yeah. And so, and so like, you know, technically the money supply expanded a lot after 2000. They expanded the money supply mm -hmm. a lot, but it didn't, re it didn't reach it's M1. It's all locked up. Yeah. It's all yeah, it's, locked it's, up in banks and stuff. And exactly. Now, so, just pull it back. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so, yeah. Whether that's a technical growth of the money supply or, or, or what. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a so, good. So hey, so we're passing the hour mark. Uh, I don't want to. Okay. I don't want to take too much of your time. I just want to ask you. Sure. Why don't we? Like, I could try to fire off quick answers instead uh, of rambling. No, I'll just. I'll just. You know, it's funny because I sent Andrew all these questions I was going to ask him, and then I haven't asked him hardly any of them. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I, I'll shoot you one last question that was on the list. You know, how can people best support you, and where other than at Andrewarchy on Steemit.com? Should they be following you in order to make sure they don't miss out on any of your content? Well, I'm glad the beauty of steam. It is that I don't even feel the need to self promote. It's, it's so great. I mean, I, you know, I post, I post content and people follow it and my followers have been growing and the rewards that I've gotten are already so generous that, uh, but, but yeah, so I, I'm trying to stick to steam it. So follow me on, you can follow me on steam it. I, I do, I have the same username on Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. I don't use Snapchat. I do use Twitter. Oh, also YouTube. You can, I think I have the same username or you can use my name. Um, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I mean, if you like the videos, if you like the type of stuff that I said, but if you don't, you don't have to. That, that's cool. Uh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing, uh, yeah, so. So yeah, uh, but steam it. I, I, I'm all in on steam it. That you know, my, my investments. The way I look at investing is, I've always believed that you have a diversified portfolio, and then you spend 
a year, two years, three years looking for a good investment. And then you go and, and then you risk as much as you feel comfortable risking in that. And that first, that was Tesla Motors. And which is, you know, as I've discussed in my videos is shock, the, the parallels are shocking to me. To, to, to the Ponzi scheme level, people were accusing Tesla Motors of being a Ponzi scheme. And I know not everybody on Steam that likes Tesla Motors, but I think most people accept now that it is not a Ponzi scheme. Mm. But it, actually, that's not true. Zero Hedge still thinks it's a, still thinks it's a Ponzi scheme. Oh, really? and who, yeah, 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 they do. Um, which is fine, which is fine. You know, I, I agree. It's a cult, fine. It's a cult that makes awesome products, fine. Um, but, you know, same thing with Steam. It. People are coming, going, it's a Ponzi scheme. And, um, and yeah, so, so this, is my next, this is my next big investment. Uh, I, I'm all in on it. I believe that it can replace all of those other things. I hope uh, and believe that at some point in the near future, those functionalities, the, the photo stream functionality of Instagram, the micro post stream of Twitter, with, uh, you know, the, the video uh, network of YouTube will all be incorporated into Steemit. And, uh, and I can't wait for that because I can't even look at them anymore. They're so, you know, they're so antiquated. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, I look at legacy, them. legacy social media. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. yeah. 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 So, yeah. All right. Well, it's and been it, a real pleasure to speak with you, Andrew. Yeah, you too. Great meeting you face to face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Camera to camera. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, my pleasure. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Gabriel Shear, uh, for joining us. And everyone, please follow at Andrarchy on Steemit.com. And have a great day.